So today uh, we will be talking about uh, Catholic Counter-Reformation and uh, we will focus on how Catholics responded to the challenge of Protestantism. Uh, the Catholic response was twofold. Um, first, Catholics uh, actually fought the Protestants in the war. That was the Thirty Years' War. That was uh, one form of a conflict between Catholics and Protestants. And the second form of the conflict was uh, theological. Uh, here, uh, Catholics responded to the Protestant concept of predestination by developing their own theology that would try to accommodate God's omnipotence and omniscience with the human free will. Uh, so that's what we are going to discuss today. Let us begin with uh, uh, the Thirty Years' War and more specifically with the Holy Roman Empire. The Thirty Years' War started in the Holy Roman Empire, uh, which was uh, located in Central Europe. So let me tell you a little bit more about this political state. Here in these images, um, you see uh, the imperial crown of the Holy Roman Empire on the right. Uh, it is now uh, located in the imperial treasury at the Hauburg Palace in Vienna, in Austria. On the left, you see the imperial cathedral of St. Bartholomew uh, in Frankfurt am Main in Germany. Uh, in that cathedral, um, the emperors of the Holy Roman Empire were elected as kings and crowned in this church. Uh, on the right uh, slide, you see the inside of the cathedral. Uh, two more slides. On the top slide, uh, you see Rummerberg, the central square in Frankfurt. Uh, this is the old town in Germany, uh, the old town in Frankfurt, Germany. That was the site of festivities that celebrated the coronation of the Holy Roman Emperors. And on the right side, you see the Römer building that has been the town hall of Frankfurt for over 600 years. So the Holy Roman Empire historically was connected with the German state. Uh, yes, we remember that the Holy Roman Empire looked to Charlemagne. You remember Charles the Great, uh, King of the Franks, uh, as its founder, uh, because Charles the Great uh, had been crowned Emperor of the Romans on Christmas Day in the year 800 by Pope Leo III. So the Western Roman Empire was uh, revived by transferring it to the Frankish king. Uh, but uh, even though Charlemagne was the first to receive coronation as emperor of the Romans, it is Otto the I, uh, the German king, uh, who was considered to be the first Holy Roman Emperor uh, in historiography. Otto I was crowned emperor by the Pope in 962. And from then on, the affairs of the German kingdom were intertwined uh, with uh, that of Italy and papacy. So here is some chronology, some of the dates we already know, the beginning of Protestantism in 1517, for example, the Augsburg Confession of Faith, which is the summary of Lutheranism that was uh, formulated in 1530. Uh, the Heidelberg Catechism, which is the summary of Calvinism, uh, that uh, was formulated in 1563. And to this, we add the Institutes of the Christian Religion, a famous uh, work by John Calvin that laid the foundation uh, for Calvinism as well as for international Protestantism. The book was 
first published in 1536. And we will also add uh, three dates that are related to the Thirty Years' War. The defenestration of Prague, the event that actually started the war that took place uh, in uh, the end of the year 1617. Uh, the beginning of the Thirty Years' War that took place in the year 1618 and the end of the war with the Peace of Westphalia that uh, was signed in 1648. Now, before we talk about the Thirty Years' War, uh, let me come back to the Peace of Augsburg. The Peace of Augsburg um, was a peace treaty that was signed between Catholics and Protestants in the Holy Roman Empire in 1555. The Holy Roman Empire was um, a political entity that consisted of 225 states. Uh, here is the Roman Empire. And uh, obviously 225 states means that those states were very small. Uh, each state uh, was ruled by the prince. Some states were ruled by secular princes. Other states were ruled by the bishops, by the Catholic bishops. The Holy Roman Empire uh, had um, the legislative branch that was called the Diet. And the Diet had three chambers. We already know that the first chamber, the highest chamber, consisted of seven princes who had the right to elect the emperor. The second uh, chamber of the Diet consisted of all other rulers of the states. Uh, again, some of them were secular princes, others were uh, Roman bishops, Catholic bishops. And the third chamber of the Diet um, included the so-called free imperial cities, uh, uh, the rulers of free imperial cities. Free imperial cities were directly subordinated to the emperor. They were not part of other states. So according to the Peace of Augsburg, um, the rulers of all those states could choose the religion of their realms, whether Lutheranism or Catholicism. And after choosing their religion, they had the right to compel their subjects to follow that faith. In Latin, this principle was read cuius regio, eius religio. The second provision of the Peace of Augsburg was that Lutherans living in a state ruled by a Catholic bishop could continue to practice their faith. And finally, the third provision, the third main provision, was that those prince bishops who converted to Lutheranism were required to give up their territories back to the Catholic Church. So the Peace of Augsburg uh, stopped the war, but not for a long time, because the Peace of Augsburg had uh, several problems. The first problem was that um, it dealt with Lutheranism, but other versions of Protestantism arose, for example, Calvinism, that spread quickly throughout Germany, and its position was not recognized by the Augsburg provisions. Second, some converted bishops simply refused to give up their states, their bishoprics. Now, the third problem uh, is that the Catholic rulers of the Holy Roman Empire uh, and the rulers of Spain uh, sought to restore the power of Catholicism in the Holy Roman Empire. Obviously, they were defending their religion. So here we have um, a transition from purely religious interests to political 
intentions. Uh, the Holy Roman Empire was ruled by uh, the House of Habsburgs. Habsburgs uh, controlled a large area of the Holy Roman Empire, including Austria, Bohemia, now Bohemia is the Czech Republic, and Hungary, totaling 8 million people. And um, uh, although the rest of the uh, Holy Roman Empire was ruled by other kings, still the Holy Roman Emperor, who was uh, often the king of Austria, exercised a significant power uh, over the whole empire, and therefore uh, they had real political power. Uh, the Holy Roman Emperor was backed up, supported by the King of Spain. Spain was a Catholic monarchy, was an absolute monarchy, and obviously Spain wanted to defend uh, their Catholic brothers. However, uh, on the side of the Protestants uh, here uh, were Sweden and Denmark. Sweden and Denmark were Protestant states that wanted to exert some influence uh, in Europe and maybe to gain some territories. So Sweden and Denmark will directly participate in the Thirty Years' War on the side of Protestantism. There was England, uh, a Protestant country uh, with a different kind of Protestantism, but also on the side of Protestant reformers. England will not participate directly in the Thirty Years' War, but will sponsor uh, the Protestant side. And finally, France. Uh, the case of France was the most interesting um, among uh, any other countries and their political intentions. France was a Catholic country. Uh, it had uh, its own Protestant uprising. Uh, the Protestants in France were called Huguenots. Uh, they were Calvinists. And uh, there was uh, almost a civil war between Huguenots and Catholics in France that ended up with the defeat of the Protestants. So France remained a Catholic country. However, in spite of their religious affiliation, um, in terms of politics, we see a different situation. There was a political rivalry between the French dynasty of Bourbons and the Austrian House of Habsburgs. France was an absolute monarchy and it wanted to exert more influence on uh, other European states. So France uh, will uh, first will not participate directly in war, but it will sponsor the war on the Protestant sides while being a Catholic country. Uh, here we have an interesting case when political interests um, are more important for the heads of the state than their religious affiliation. So France will not enter the war uh, in the first several phases of it, uh, but France will support, will sponsor uh, the Protestant side. And in the last phase, France would declare war on the Holy Roman Empire and on Spain, and will directly uh, participate in the war on the side of the Protestants. The Thirty Years' War started, as many wars do, uh, with uh, uh, an episode that had little to do um, with the overall situation in Europe. I mean, um, it was a serious incident. It was an incident between Catholics and Protestants, but it was an isolated event. And this isolate, isolated event um, should not have uh, led necessarily to the war, but that's how wars uh, often begin, uh, pretty much out of nothing. So here is what happened. The Holy Roman Emperor was also the king of Bohemia, one of the states 
in the Holy Roman Empire. Now it is the Czech Republic. And by the year 1617, it was obvious that uh, this Holy Roman Emperor, whose name was Matthias, uh, would die without a hair. Um, and therefore, according to dynastic rules, uh, his lands uh, would be going to his nearest male relative, his cousin, Archduke Ferdinand II of Austria. He was a staunch Catholic and wanted to impose uh, religious uniformity on his lands. So that meant that Bohemia will turn Catholic uh, while all Bohemians were Protestants. So therefore, the intention of Archduke Ferdinand II uh, felt uh, like the insult uh, to the Protestant Bohemia uh, nobility. And uh, those guys rejected uh, the Ferdinand, uh, who had been elected uh, Bohemian Crown Prince in 1617. And not only they rejected him, but they also rejected his emissaries. Now, Archduke Ferdinand II um, sent uh, some of his people uh, to the royal palace uh, uh, in Prague. Prague was the capital of Bohemia as it is now the capital of the Czech Republic. So uh, Ferdinand sent his emissaries to the royal palace to prepare uh, for his enthronement. And uh, the group of uh, uh, those emissaries arrived in the royal palace. Uh, in this slide, you see uh, the royal palace. And here is the same building, but from a different angle. So while uh, arriving, in the palace, they were met by Bohemian nobles. And instead of uh, uh, warm welcoming, those Bohemian nobles actually threw uh, those guys out from the window. Now, uh, here on the right slide, I can show you the window uh, from which those guys were thrown. This, this is the window. So it was pretty high and um, the, the guys were lucky because uh, right underneath this building there was a pile of horse manure and they landed on this horse manure. They survived but um, it was a disgusting episode and it was an insult to the Archduke Ferdinand II of Austria. Uh, so this event is known in the history as the defenestration of Prague and it started the Thirty Years' War. So the Thirty Years' War started with a Bohemian revolt in 1618. It lasted for about six years. The Catholics uh, were able um, to be victorious with the help of Spain. Uh, but when uh, Danes and Swedish saw that um, the Protestants are losing the fight, they intervened and they declared their participation in the war. So the second phase of the Thirty Years' War started with the Danish inter intervention in 1625. The third phase started with the Swedish intervention in 1630. And finally, the last uh, phase of the Thirty Years' War started with the French intervention on the side of Protestants in 1635. There have been many battles fought during those 30 years. Eight million people died as a result of that. Um, eight million total casualties and losses, including civilian lives. Finally, in 1648, a group of treaties known as the Peace of Westphalia put an end to the war. Now remember that this was the last major religious war in mainland Europe. And um, the results of the war were quite significant. They rearranged European power structures. As a result of the war, uh, the Holy Roman Empire was weakened 
and so was the power of the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, the German state was divided into many states. The Netherlands won independence out of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, the um, states of Sweden and uh, Denmark uh, became more influential in Europe. Um, and so did uh, France. And finally, uh, the Peace of Westphalia laid the foundation for the basic tenets of the sovereign nation states in Europe. Now let's move on from the military actions to the theological debates. The Thirty Years' War uh, ended with Protestants being able to exercise the freedom of conscience and to practice their own religion. That was the result of the military confrontation between Catholics and Protestants. When it comes to the theological confrontation between Catholics and Protestants, the situation was um, much more complicated. The Catholics formulated their response to the Protestant Reformation in the Church Council of Trent that started in 1545 and that uh, ended in 1563. They also created uh, a special order, the Order of Jesuits in 1534, um, whose task was to counteract the influence of Protestantism and Protestant Reformation. The uh, most important theological controversy between Protestants and Catholics focused on the concept of predestination, the concept that was uh, introduced, or I would rather say reintroduced into Christianity by Martin Luther and John Calvin. The reason why I'm saying the concept of was reintroduced is because the concept of predestination was not alien to the Christian thought. Uh, it dates back to the thought of Saint Augustine and to his uh, famous debate about uh, predestination versus uh, free will with Pelagius. So that's what we are going to discuss now because in order to understand uh, how Protestants thought about predestination, we have to talk about St. Augustine and his formulation of the concept of the original sin. As I told you many times, Christianity is the religion of four major doctrines or concepts. The concept of the original sin, the concept of bodily resurrection, the concept of the Trinity, and the concept of heaven and hell. We already talked about bodily resurrection, the Trinity, and we keep talking about heaven and hell, but we did not discuss the idea of the original sin yet. So this is the time to discuss that idea. The idea of the original sin was first formulated in Christianity by Saint Augustine in the fourth century. And uh, in Saint Augustine's interpretation, it is about the biblical story of the fall uh, of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So in order to understand Saint Augustine's thought, we have to remind ourselves of this story. The biblical story of the fall is the second story in the Bible. The first story in the Bible is the story of creation, when God created um, everything out of nothing in six days, and God rested on the seventh day because creation was perfect. Now, if you believe in one God, and this God is both omniscient and omnipotent. And if this God is also omnibenevolent, then 
uh, you would really question yourself about the origin of evil. Because uh, how could this God, who knows everything, uh, who has good intentions, and who has all the power, how could this God have created evil? If you believe in many gods, then you have no problem with this question. You simply assign evil to one of the gods, and uh, you call uh, him an evil god. And then you have a struggle between a good god and an evil god. But if you have only one god, this is really a serious question. So whoever wrote the Bible, whoever composed the Bible, uh, obviously realized the difficulty. And therefore, the second story in the Bible is the story that tells us about the origin of evil. Now, let's remember the setting of the story. We have the Garden of Eden, which is described in the Bible as paradise. We have Adam and Eve, the first couple that was created by God. Uh, we have the serpent, the most cunning of all animals, who um, tempts Adam and Eve to do something that God prohibited them to do. We have the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And in this story, God uh, prohibits Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So the serpent is tempting the first couple and the serpent is saying that uh, God is lying, that uh, they should actually taste the fruits of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and nothing bad will happen. Uh, Adam and Eve succumb to temptation, and God shows up, and uh, the first couple realize that they are naked, and they are ashamed, and God, as a result, punishes everyone. He punishes Adam and Eve, he punishes the serpent, um, and um, here comes the end of the story. So the question remains, uh, who is responsible for the origin of evil in the story, and what is evil? So who is responsible? Uh, is it God who actually orchestrated the whole thing? Uh, is it Adam and Eve? who actually succumbed to temptation? Is it the serpent who tempted Adam and Eve? Or as one of my students once suggested, maybe this is the fruit from the tree that was hanging in there. Now in traditional um, interpretations of the story, uh, first of all, it is assumed that uh, the sin, the biblical sin is uh, not to follow the will of God. So when human beings are told what to do and um, they uh, reject the will of God and do something that is contrary to what they are told, they uh, become sinful and uh, therefore it is the human beings who originate evil. And to be able to originate evil, human beings uh, have free will because human beings are the only creatures on earth that have free will and therefore have the capacity to disobey God. So that is the standard understanding of the story and both the Jews and the Muslims explain the story as uh, a um, narrative about human free will, uh, about the fact that humans have some good impulses and bad impulses, and uh, that humans make mistakes, and they are punished for this mistake. However, Saint Augustine came up with a different understanding uh, and interpretation of the story that will become unique to Christianity. According to Saint Augustine, uh, the whole story is about the reward and punishment, but what is even more important, what kind of reward and punishment we are talking about. 
According to St. Augustine, Adam and Eve um, did possess a free will. And what is free will? Free will is having both capacities, capacity to sin and capacity not to sin. Had Adam and Eve followed the will of God, had they not eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they would have been rewarded. And as a reward, God would have removed from them the capacity to sin. And Adam and Eve would have become like angels. Uh, in Christian theology, angels are those beings, those creatures that do not have free will and can only do good things. However, Adam and Eve decided to disobey God, to break the commandment, to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And as a punishment, God has removed from them the capacity not to sin. That's how St. Augustine introduces the idea of the original sin. The original sin is more than just a personal sin because uh, as a result of this punishment, all of Adam and Eve's posterity were born with a distorted human nature. We all are born with a capacity to sin and we all are naturally inclined toward sinning. That is why, according to St. Augustine, the sacrifice of Jesus was so important and the baptism is so important because when we are baptized, baptism uh, washes away our uh, sinful inclinations and our true nature is restored. We still uh, have the capacity to sin and not to sin. We re regain our capacity uh, to choose good over evil. So in the fourth century, there was a man uh, who um, debated St. Augustine um, and his theories about original sin and human nature. His name was Pelagius. Uh, Pelagius was a Christian theologian, uh, a contemporary of St. Augustine, uh, but Pelagius held a totally different views. Pelagius thought that human beings always possess a free will. And this free will entails both capacities to sin and not to sin. Pelagius uh, rejected the idea of the original sin and uh, thought that uh, Adam and Eve's mistakes uh, are not uh, inherited by their posterity. Even more so, Pelagius uh, thought that um, even before Jesus Christ, uh, many people were righteous and uh, you can go to heaven without being baptized. Uh, he taught that you can go to heaven by being Jewish as well as by being Christian. So he had uh, various doctrines that went against main, mainstream Christianity of the day. Um, and therefore he was proclaimed a heretic. He was exiled. And in their debate, uh, St. Augustine prevailed and the doctrine of the original sin became one of the central doctrines of Christianity. So the doctrine of the original sin and the corresponding view that human beings uh, are naturally inclined toward evil became an inspiration for many Catholic theologians. And uh, this idea is, the idea of the original sin is closely related to the idea of predestination. But the idea of predestination is going even further. So Martin Luther and John Calvin were influenced by the thought of St. Augustine. Um, and um, 
even more so, they argued that um, the all-powerfulness uh, of God means that uh, everything that is happening in the world is happening under direct command from God. And therefore, uh, not only human beings are naturally weak and uh, naturally powerless and naturally sinful, uh, but they also have a limited freedom of will uh, because their free will does not uh, extend uh, to their own choices of either salvation or damnation. It is God uh, who is omnipotent and who decides for some reasons that are unknown to human beings, who will be saved and who will be damned. Hence, the idea of predestination, that from the moment of our birth, we are predestined either for hell or for heaven. And no matter how hard we try, we cannot change that predestination. Now, for Catholics, uh, that doctrine was unacceptable because it led to many paradoxes that could not be resolved rationally. For example, uh, God is all-powerful, uh, all-good, and all-knowing. And according to Protestants, God predestined some people to hell, no matter what. Now, what does this mean? Obviously, being predestined to hell is not good. So does this mean that God is not uh, all good while predestined, while, while uh, making this choice, making sure that some people go to hell? That cannot be. Um, maybe God did not know that some people are going to hell, but then God is not omniscient. Well, maybe he did know, but he did not have enough power to uh, prevent that, then God is not all-powerful. So it seems that you cannot reconcile the concept of predestination in its Protestant version with the notion of the Christian God, who is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent. So Catholics uh, came up with their own response to the Protestant idea of predestination by distinguishing between the so-called sufficient grace and the efficacious grace. According to Catholic doctrine, God's contribution to human salvation uh, is called the sufficient grace. God's grace is everywhere and God's grace is for everyone. God wants everyone to be saved. Hence, he is omnibenevolent. Um, however, this is a potential grace. God offers salvation. And it is up to humans to accept it or to reject it. So here comes the human free will. Uh, it is up to the humans um, to choose between salvation and damnation, between good life and evil life, between following the will of God and not following the will of God. And uh, when this potential grace that is always available to everyone is actualized, it becomes uh, the efficacious grace. So according to Catholic theologians, the efficacious grace is when humans freely accept the divine offer of salvation. So according to Catholic theologians, there is an interplay between divine offer and human response. And human response is as important as the divine offer. Without the divine offer, we all are damned. However, with this divine offer, some of us will be damned because that will be our own decision. So in other words, when we are saved, we are saved by God. When we are damned, we are damned by ourselves. 
Now this idea uh, is artistically expressed uh, in one of the plays by Tirso de Molina, the play called Damned for Despair. Uh, Tirso de Molina uh, was uh, a monk and a playwright who lived during the golden age of Spanish theater. Um, Tirso de Molina was a very prolific uh, playwright. Uh, wrote, he wrote uh, hundreds of plays and uh, Damned for Despair is one of his masterpieces. Uh, Damned for Despair uh, was uh, written uh, around 1624 and it is a theological play that um, is trying to criticize uh, the Protestant ideas through the characters in the play. The main theological point at issue in Jesus' play is the question of human free will versus divine grace. And in his play, Tirso conflated together two separate legends. The story of the hermit, whose salvation is linked to that of a thief, and the story of the hermit who betrays his faith because a thief is saved. This is about the mystery of God's grace. So here is the plot of the play. We have two main characters. One is Paolo and another one is Enrico. Paolo is a hermit who turns to the life of crime and ends up in hell. Here is how it happens. Paolo is a hermit, but um, like Martin Luther, uh, he is not quite sure about his salvation. And uh, here, Tirso de Molina obviously writes a parody on Martin Luther and his own spiritual crisis. So Paulo is a hermit, but he is easily tricked by the devil who disguises himself as an angel and suggests that Paulo's fate is linked to the fate of another person, Enrico. And when Paulo actually meets Enrico, uh, in order to see uh, whether he is saved or damned, he uh, is realizing that since Enrico is a criminal uh, and since Enrico's fate is directly linked to Paolo's fate, Paolo must be damned himself. So uh, it is quite clear that Tirso is describing the idea of Protestant predestination. Paolo is convinced that uh, uh, his fate is predetermined. He simply did not, did not know what kind of predetermination that was. And now that he believes he knows that, he decides to turn to the life of crime. So here is Paolo's reasoning. It is certain that Enrico will never be saved. And that is his mistake. Uh, the devil disguised as God's angel says that I will share Enrico's end. He does not realize that this is the devil because in the beginning uh, he does not have certainty about his salvation and he assumes the idea of predestination. So hence he comes to a, the wrong conclusion. I must be damned already. And since he believed that uh, he had earned the right to be saved by years spent as a hermit, he now um, goes against God. He uh, thinks that God is unjust and therefore he turns to the life of crime. However, the end of the play uh, represents the reversal of fortunes. Enrico uh, was a criminal, but he had a soft spot for his father and at some point he decided to repent. And because of his heartfelt repentance, he is saved by God. While Paolo, who believes that he is damned already, never repents and ends up in hell. The moral lesson of the story is also quite clear. No one never knows whether uh, he or she is saved or damned until he or she dies. Uh, it is up to us uh, to accept God's offer or to reject God's offer. 
and everyone can be saved if they sincerely repent. That was the main criticism uh, of the Protestant idea of predestination by Catholics in uh, the 16th and the 17th century. And that concludes my present lecture. Thank you for watching. See you next time.